Hi, welcome to Breakfast in Biology, day number 49. 49. Four days left, including today. Three after today. Thanks for those of you that are saying you waited yesterday. I mean, we said we weren't going to be here on Memorial Day, but thanks for waiting for us. <laughs> oh, and we had a thing scheduled because I did them all like two weeks ago and didn't realize we weren't going to be here. I should have deleted that. I'm sorry, guys. That's my fault. <laughs> that's that's my fault. Who's here today? Eli's here talking about us making money. Um, Darius, Zuli, Gladys, Maya, Lexi, Aiden, Annie, Emily, Abby. Is that it? It doesn't look like a lot. I'm only seeing 11 people watching so far, but that normally pops up pretty quick after we start. Chris is here too. Good morning. Good morning, Carissa. It's nice to see you. A thousand subscribers, then we can make peanuts. That's what they're saying. We can. Cohen, Jake. <sighs> All right. Well, should we get into it? I mean, is there anything, is there a reason to wait around? No. It's 1030. 1031. Let's go. Um... Survival of the fittest, man. They should be here. Right. So we've been talking about evolution. And we, we love this. If you haven't figured out, we love this topic. We think it's really cool. Um, we said a lot last week that evolution is real. Because you define it as change over time and organisms change over time. We talked about the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. And this week, we want to get into this microevolution idea or speciation idea a little bit more because we gave you a mechanism. We told you that there's such a thing as natural selection, and we went through a bunch of different reasons. Like, we make more offspring than will survive, and the ones that are best fit to survive will grow up and reproduce and blah, 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 and all of that. But that's not maybe just even enough, right? So what are some of the other things that are kind of play a role in this idea of speciation? So let's talk about that. And I guess we need to know, Mrs. Smith, what a species is. Right. And so like when we talk about a species, a lot of times people think about it as just a category. And they say, oh, that we're talking about like homo sapiens. We're talking about humans. You know, that's a species. Oh, we're going to talk about penguins. That that's a species. But really, you know, a lot of times when we talk about and you use a term as a species, what you're really talking about is a class or an order or one of the other uh, parts of that kingdom all the way down. But species in particular, when we talk about them, are a group that can actually reproduce together and not only reproduce together, but make fertile offspring. And if they can't do that, then they are separate species. And so the example that's there are bluebirds. There's actually a couple of different species of bluebirds. In particular, this one's showing the eastern bluebird and the western bluebird. So because they don't interbreed, then they are separate species. And there's a couple of different reasons um, that we're going to talk about of why maybe a species doesn't interbreed. It doesn't necessarily just mean that they can't. It just means that they won't or don't. Right. And it does, I mean, it kind of does, well, correct me if I'm wrong here, it kind of does mean, in some regards, that they can't. Sometimes, I mean, to be a true species, because if we go back to species, you have to be able to produce fertile offspring. So sometimes they could breed, but still not produce fertile offspring. So and, and we're driving that home. It's that they can't reproduce and make fertile offspring. Let's say that. Is that right? Right. Okay. Sort of, maybe. Let's get into it. So we're going to start with talking about some reproductive isolating mechanisms. So real quick, think about this in terms of organisms are in a group and they can breed and they can have offspring. And then something happens that makes that reality stop. All right. And there can be several things. For one, there's a list of them here. We'll just run down the list. Geographic isolation. Maybe there's a barrier. Maybe there's a new river. Maybe 
through some geograph geological event, there's a mountain in between them. Maybe there's, you know, whatever you want to call, but somehow they get geographically isolated. So what was once a, a population is now two populations separated by some kind of physical barrier. Temporal isolation. Temporal means time. So this could be something as simple as their breeding season is different. So where they might, um, this particular bird might breed in the spring, this particular bird might breed in late summer. And because they don't look for mates at the same time, that prevents them from breeding. Could be behavioral isolation. So maybe there's a bird like a peacock that has a very specific dance that it does to get the other member, the other sex excited, right? You know, because that's important if you want to breed with them, I guess. And so that behavior doesn't translate. And I mean, just think about your, your own life. I mean, there's people that do certain behaviors that wouldn't translate with you, right? That doesn't, that doesn't get you excited, so to speak. Um, a, me a mechanical isolation. So maybe one of the reasons that they can't breed anymore is because the parts don't fit. Take a moment. Let that sink in. Think about it. They don't breed because the parts don't fit. Mrs. Smith made this slide, and she has this beautiful little picture down here of the damselfly parts. Right? And so different damselflies have different parts, and one species of dance of fun. That's insane. Or a big round hole, you know? Right. It's like that thing you got when you were a kid and it had like the square and the triangle and the octagon. Your one piece fits in one, but not the others. You following us? And it's not just, you know, I also like to bring up the plant thing too, because a lot of times we think about like sexual reproduction as only being that type of thing. But if you think about like flowers, they go through sexual reproduction, but they need other organisms to help them, you know, go through that process. And so if you have a flower that has a very narrow um, flower, you know, I mean, there's only certain organisms, like maybe a hummingbird that's going to feed off of that, that can get down into that, that's going to help to pollinate versus one that is very open and bees and things are going to go in there. And so there's different organisms that help to pollinate. And so you don't have cross pollination that's occurring there. So mechanical, the mechanics of what needs to happen to fertilize the sperm and the egg doesn't work. And then <laughs> Salika is like, why? Because it's important. It's important to understand this. Like why, you know, why isn't, why do some things don't breed? And then the last one, gametic isolation, which is interesting too, because this is like saying the sperm doesn't get to the egg. And you you think to yourself, maybe, well, if mechanical isolation doesn't work, like if the parts don't fit, that's why the sperm doesn't get to the egg. But what about something like a frog that lays its eggs in the water and then the male frog sprays sperm on the eggs? So what's to stop a sperm from a fish that gets sprayed into the water too from hitting those eggs and fertilizing them? And so it's a gametic isolation that the, they still don't work because they don't recognize each other and it just doesn't happen. So a lot of times the egg and the, sper like the sperm can't enter the egg that happens in gametic isolation. So these things are what we would call prezygotic. So zygote, think about what a zygote is. So a sperm hits an egg, fertilized, starts to reproduce, we form a zygote. These are prezygotic. So these are things that happen before that ever happens. So geographic isolation, behavioral, time, temporal, breeding season, whatever, mechanical, all these things prevent that from happening. So if you have prezygotic, you also would have postzygotic. And so when we talk about uh, postzygotic, these are ones that are able to form a zygote. But then maybe the zygote doesn't survive. So that would be zygote mortality. So, you know oh, hey, the, the sperm and the egg were able to come together, but they just don't get to an actual offspring that is living. It dies before, um, you know, being born or the hybrids are sterile. And this is a very common thing that happens with hybrids. And so one of the most common examples is the idea of a mule. And um, 
you know, I lived in Lancaster County for a long time. And if I had talked about mules up there in the Amish country, um, everybody has seen them because Amish use mules a lot. Mules are actually a hybrid. They come from a cross between a horse and a donkey. And so, you know, horses have 32 pairs of chromosomes. Donkeys have 31 uh, pairs of chromosomes in, in, in their gametes. And so when they're joined together, they're close enough that they produce a viable offspring. But with 63 chromosomes, that mule cannot make a gamete. And so it's not, it's sterile. It won't produce offspring. So you can't breed a mule and a mule and get more mules. That doesn't work. The only way you get it is if you breed a horse and a donkey. So every mule that you might see, they're very vigorous. Um, they, they work very hard, but they are sterile. Um, some other ones that Mr. Suter thinks are fake, um, the zonkey up there at the top, which is a mix between a zebra and a donkey. Again, the numbers of chromosomes, they are also sterile. And then you have ligers and tigons. Um, that's a picture of a liger up there. A liger is when you have a male lion and a female tiger. A tigon, which looks a little bit different, um, is a male tiger and a female uh, lion. And then you might be thinking, well, what about like, you know, other things that are close like jaguars and cheetahs and those sorts of things. And uh, some of those have things like zygote mortality or they just their gametes from the prezygotic don't work. So when we're talking about hybrids, a lot of times the number of chromosomes have to be very, very close together um, to even get a, a viable or potential uh, working offspring. And then every once in a while, we get uh, zygotes that work and actually make a generation and they can actually can reproduce. But then after that, then you get into that, like the hybrid doesn't, can't reproduce anymore. And one of the great ones of that is, is cultivated rice. So like rice, we have hybrids of rice that we eat and they last for about a generation or two and then you have to get rid of them. Oh, a lot of plants can be that way. So they're good for one or two generations and then no good. So and you would understand as biology students this year, you would totally understand why this works. You would understand why if a horse has 32 pairs and a donkey has 31, and then the mules put them together to get 63 chromosomes, you understand why they need to be even. Because if you think about the whole process of meiosis, right, you have two divisions. The first division is separating the pairs, and if there's an uneven number, you don't have an even number of pairs to separate, and that's why it stops working. That's why it breaks down. So really kind of interesting stuff. So how does this, why does this, all this, you know, where does it go from here? So if you look at this slide, small changes can cause changes in appearance, but a change in appearance might not be enough. But basically what we have is like one species will split over time if you start putting these isolation mechanisms that we talked about. So if you isolate them, geographically or whatever. And then you start adding natural selection to that too. And so things are living in a different niche. And if you live in a different niche, the environment's going to have different selection pressures. I think I'm saying this right. So think about it. Like your food source might be different. Your shelter source might be different. So natural selection is going to select for different traits. And over time, as these two populations are separated, there can be enough change that when they're brought back together, either through behavioral or whatever isolating mechanism it is, they don't breed anymore and they can't produce viable offspring. And so now we would call them two different species. Right. Where the gradualism portion on the left a lot of times doesn't necessarily cause a new species. I mean, you can even think about humans in this respect with that. You know, if you think about uh, our skin tones, how they were very distinctly different, even though we were all the same species. But over time, as we're able to travel around the world more, the skin tones are starting to become more mixed because that's, you know, in human society, uh, how do I want to say this? Like, it's just more possible because we can travel all over the place. So... 
you know what I mean? That's, but we haven't changed our species. We haven't, you know what I mean? It's just that that has happened. So if you think about like, oh, the coloring of one particular bird has changed that really changed their species sometimes perhaps, but it depends on if that they're changing as a whole population or if there's portions of the population that have changed. And again, we're just touching the surface of this. Yeah, there's a whole lot of stuffs. Yeah, we're just kind of touching the surface of this. So really it's about isolation and about the fact that in order to get a new species, they have to be isolated from each other in some way. And this is showing a geographical isolation, which is one of the things Mr. Shooter talked about, but it, it can also be any of those other you know, limiting factors that would cause them to be separated from one another. All right. And just another example, right? Yep. So just showing how they were isolated and then you start to see a change in their genetics and then that causes them, even if they do come back, then they're isolated from each other right reproductively, which would then cause speciation. So I think, oh, wait, we wanted this one, right? And then, so the, the Galapagos, the birds that Darwin found in the Galapagos are just like one of the, he made them one of the prime examples of that, right? So this idea of adaptive radiation and as things change, uh, we can get more into that slide if you want, but Mrs. Smith, but what I was just going to, kind of wrap up what we're talking about today with is just this idea that these things are known, if that makes sense. So when we talk about the evolutionary theory, we're talking about a theory that we take all the science and everything we know and we apply it and we go, this is what we think happens and this is how we think happens and here's the mechanism for it to happen. Right? So when you look at this idea of microevolution, speciation, when you look at this idea like one bird becoming one, two, three, four, five, six maybe different birds over time, six different species over time, these are things that we really can see. So it's really hard to argue that. It's really hard to say, I don't believe in evolution. Right? Where I And I, I like to point it out. And I know that there's evolutionary scientists that would disagree with me where it becomes tougher for people is when we get to the amphibian to reptile, reptile to bird, these macro evolutions, these, you know, not just a speciation, a change in species, but now we're talking, when we think about kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, those jumps to classes, to phylums, to kingdoms even, right? Because at some point the bacteria had to become protus, had to become whatever, you know, bigger, bigger jumps. And that's really simplifying it. I know, I always know when I'm really simplifying something because Mrs. Smith looks up at the skit set and starts processing. You can tell by a look on her face. And then we remind her that's not AP bio, but it, it's, it's those bigger jumps that people struggle with. Now, all the science still shows us that there's relationships there. So tomorrow, I think what we'll probably end talking evolution with is those relationships and why we think those things happen. And we already talked about some of the evidence with homologous structures and analogous structures and vestigial structures and physiological stuff and fossil records and all that. But um, we're not giving you new assignments this week. We are going to finish talking today and tomorrow about evolution. And I think what we might do Thursday and Friday, we need to talk about it a little bit more, but there might be a little maybe competition at end of the year. Like we're not taking the keystones, but we've spent all year banging our heads against the wall, preparing you for the keystones. So maybe a little competition, you know, and who, what, what student is going to uh, reign supreme? Is it going to be a, uh, you know, not that it would be against Mr. Shooter and I, but it wouldn't be a suitor. Student. Oh my gosh. I'm not doing it now. If one of if one of your students wins, you'll never let me live it down. Oh well, the same goes though that you'll never let me let me. Oh, wasn't it my student that won? That's what you'll say. I, no, no, I'm just not nearly as competitive as you are. 
<laughs> oh. um, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> We are so happy to see your names. We're so happy to see everybody that was here. If you hadn't said, if you didn't say hi to us in the beginning, please do. Grade book as it stands right now, I think I have graded everything that I have access to. I have a couple of things I missed over the long weekend. Oh, so I, I do need to look at the flip grids. I haven't gone back and looked at the flip grids yet. So I'll try and add the flip grids sometime today or tomorrow morning. If you haven't done the flip grid yet, please do that. Uh, as soon as I put zeros in for the last two assignments that are stars, then you'll know what your grade. I mean, you know where you stand because that's what's in there. Right. Unless you come and win the competition and maybe we'll throw some bonus points in there last minute. You know what I mean? I think, I think Eli wants to take you down. I think so too. I'm feeling a little, uh, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> all right. You know what here, this is the way I'm going to look at it for Eli and some of the other people that might come back and take AP, then you'll all be my students one day anyway. And so we all get along. <laughs> awesome. All right. I think that's it for us, right? Yeah, I think so. All right. We miss y'all. And I know Dom showed up late and he said hi like 50 times. So we better say hi to him. <laughs> oh, Dominic in the house. Okay, bye. Yes, have a great day. Wash your hands. Take care of yourself. We love you. Um, Valerie.